Your relationship with food plays a bigger role in your injuries and performance than you realize. Today, we're gonna to go through the latest research on nutrition and injuries and how you can help put yourself, your patients, and your athletes in the best situation for success. First, we need to define a key term. Energy availability is the amount of energy left over after we account for the energy expenditure of exercise. This is the fuel that you have for your body to function after it's accounted for all the training that you've been doing. It would make sense that you naturally keep the balance of energy in versus energy out equal. It's really easy to leave your body under fueled and not ready for the demands of the day. And people under fuel for lots of different reasons. Someone could have an eating disorder, a serious medical diagnosis. It's common for runners to display disordered eating or an inappropriate relationship with food. And lastly, they could just be unintentionally under fueling. They don't have a good plan, which is common when you're dealing with athletes that have a busy work or life schedule and their training is increased. If your energy needs are met, you are at the risk of developing low energy availability. And if that mismatch goes on for too long, you can develop relative energy deficiency in sport, or REDS, the topic of today's video. The International Olympic Committee just put out a new consensus statement on REDS in sport. REDS is a syndrome of impaired physiological and or psychological functioning experienced by female and male athletes caused by exposure to problematic low energy availability. And it affects every system of your body. This helpful graphic shows what happens when we've been exposed to low energy availability for too long. Our body starts to prioritize resources from other functions to make sure we're staying upright and breathing. This adaptive process is something that's helped humans survive for long periods of time. It would be really helpful if you were stuck in a desert or going through a time of famine for your body to start to pull resources from other body systems to make sure you're staying upright. The human body prioritizes survival over everything else, including your bones. Unfortunately, low energy availability is very common in distance runners, with up to 31% of females and 25% of male distance runners showing signs and symptoms of low energy availability. It's like a switch is pulled, changing your body's priorities from reproduction and health to simply survival. Let's talk about some fundamental principles of bone. Your skeleton adapts to the stresses that you place on it. As you grow and develop, your bones get bigger, denser, and better designed to deal with the demands of your specific life. These changes happen throughout your entire lifespan. Bone is always changing. Your skeleton will adapt the size and structure of your bones to deal with the demands that you placed on them. Bone stress injuries can be a big fear for runners. These three bone properties can help prevent those injuries from happening. The size of your bones is largely determined during your growing years. In the first third of your life, your body is going to create bigger bones that are less likely to break. And this is largely influenced by your genetic genetics and the activities that you participate in. Bigger bones mean stronger bones. A bigger bone is stronger, but so is a denser bone. Bone density or the amount of bone tissue present in a specific area plays a big role in fracture resistance. Bone density is 60 to 80% genetic, but can also be influenced by your fueling, the medications that you take, and the activities that you participate in. A denser bone is a stronger bone. This is unfortunate for distance runners. When we compare distance runners to other athletes, we often see that multi-directional sport athletes like soccer players and basketball players have denser skeletons. And up to 40% of female adolescent runners show a negative one on a DEXA or worse meaning their skeleton is trending towards osteopenia or low bone density. This is likely due to the fact that they have to deal with higher loads, stopping, starting, jumping, and rest breaks that we don't see in distance running. The culture around fueling body image and body weight in distance running also likely plays a role in this. Lastly, bone microarchitecture or the actual layout of your skeleton plays a role in fracture resistance. Your bones adapt in a site-specific manner, meaning the bones that get stressed get stronger. They also adapt in a direction-specific manner, meaning that the direction of loads, the types of loads that you place on them, the skeleton will adapt to that and not something else. I know this is very sciencey. But this relationship between these three variables plays a big role in the likelihood of you developing a bone stress injury. To me, this is like making a good cup of pour over coffee. There's three different variables that go into making a good cup of coffee. First, you wanna make sure you choose the best beans. You wanna make sure that the ratio of those beans to the water that you used is in the right order. Now, if we throw off any one of these three variables in our skeleton or in our cup of coffee, the end product is not gonna be as good. You might have a diluted cup of coffee or a bone that's more likely to fracture. And unfortunately, if you get diagnosed with red S, 
This will wreak havoc on all of those three qualities. Because bone growth and preservation is largely determined by hormonal loads outside of mechanical loads. This means that if your hormone function is not in order, it doesn't matter if you make the best training decisions, you still are likely at a risk of developing a bone stress injury. And if we go back to that original graphic, when you have red S, your hormone function goes to pot. Now this is all very depressing. What are we supposed to do with this? As rehab providers or coaches, it's crucial that we understand the implications of red S. We also need to know what we should be doing from a screening perspective and what to be looking out for in our patients and athletes. And that's where this most recent IOC statement comes in. The IOC statement on red S breaks down the risk factors for red S into primary, secondary, and potentially other indicators. And if you have one or more of these different levels of indicators, your likelihood for red S goes up. A lot of this can be screened for with a simple conversation or form. And then we stratify what the risk is for that individual, just like this graphic shows. Looking at mild risk, moderate to high risk, or high to extreme risk, depending on the clinical criteria and the exposure period. That screening is the first step in the process of diagnosis. Once that screening has occurred, we look at the severity or risk assessment. And then finally, we go to diagnosis where a physician diagnoses the athlete with red S. And then they develop a specific treatment plan. This consensus statement is really powerful and gives you a lot of key tools when you're working with your patients and athletes. It's also important to remember that rehab providers and coaches are not the experts in nutrition. That's reserved for registered dietitians. If someone is having trouble with fueling, it's crucial to refer them to a dietitian to get an accurate plan because the last thing a runner wants to deal with is an injury that keeps them from running or a worse health consequence if red S goes on for too long. I encourage you to read the full text of this paper, which is in the description. Thanks so much for watching. I hope you found this helpful and leave any questions in the comments below.